All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our Writing Yourself workshop today. Uh, my name is Carrie Pace. I'm the Associate Dean of MBA programs here at Georgetown McDonough. Uh, I, along with my colleague, Lauren Apicella, are thrilled to offer you this session as part of Operation Cure Personalis. Uh, for those of you that did not participate in Operation Cure Personalis last year, um, Operation Cure Personalis is a series that we developed that encourages our community to make more meaningful connections and to take care of themselves and each other um, with events and workshops that focus on mental health and well being, along with connection. Um, today, I am very excited to introduce you to my friend from back in the days, uh, Chloe Miller. Um, Chloe is a writer and a teacher living here in Washington, D.C. Um, she is, her poetry collection actually was just published, I believe, last year um, in 2021, and her poetry chapbook, Unrest, was published in 2013. Uh, Chloe is the recipient of the DC Arts and Humanities Fellowship Grant, um, and she teaches writing classes at the University of Maryland, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson, and Politics and Prose, as well as private lessons. Um, so I wanted to remind all of you to um, please use the, if you are going to submit questions, uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, uh, just submit a question and I will do my best to help you out. The session is being recorded um, and we will share it in the next few days. With that, I am going to kick it off with Chloe. Thanks, Chloe. Hi. Thanks, Carrie. Welcome, everyone. I'm happy to see the number of people here, and I hope that this is of interest to you. Um, so as Carrie said, my name is Chloe Miller, and I'm the author of Viable, which came out last February, and a Chapbook, which is a smaller collection of poetry, Unrest, which came out in 2013. And I'm here today. I titled the workshop Write Yourself, and I think what's really important for all of us as humans is to think about how we create things in our daily lives all of the time. The way that I do that is through writing. And I think that this is a really accessible way for almost all of us to get to know ourselves really well and then understand the world around us. There's a saying, write what you know, but I'm going to say to do the opposite and instead really write what it is you want to know. So the first thing um, that I'd like to know is who's here with us? Who are you and what are you interested in? So what I would like you to do, if that's okay, is take a moment in the chat. You should see a button in the bottom of the page if you haven't opened it already to say, if you like your name, one, and then two, something you have created. So I'm gonna write a note in the chat, name and something you've created. We are, I deeply believe this, all creating things all of the time. It could be that you've cooked a breakfast that you created on purpose in a purposeful fashion. Um, it could be that you've arranged your books in some particular way, art on the wall. You've written something, you've drawn something, you've painted something, you've put together your wardrobe. It could be anything. All right, good. We're getting starting to see some creations. We have a gluten-free cake. That sounds delicious. It's lunchtime. So if you all write foods, we'll be nice and hungry and ready to create some more. Rosemary, oops, fast. Um, created, hi, Rosemary, created books with family memories. Beautiful. Memoir, collecting ideas, banana bread, painting, some writing, a human, that's big, a painting, a short story, photography, space in my apartment for yoga and meditation. I really like that. Part of this workshop is not just about creating something, but making room for it. However, that looks for you. A newsletter, a new home, complete renovation, designed a completely new space, a song, spreadsheets for work since I'm an uncreative accountant, Alex says. Okay, this is what I would really like to say to all of you. Um, you're affiliated with the business school. I think we have this misconception that those of us who are doing business, accounting, legal work, all of these various professions are not creative. But I think that's really the wrong way to think about it. The only way that you can draw to draw a new connection, put things together, understand them better is by being creative. 
this is how we relate in the world. It's not, con our creativity is not confined to that moment when we say, here are my oil paints and I'm going to make a masterpiece painting. We're creating things all of the time. And hopefully this list is giving a sense of that, not to pick on Alex, but I think a lot, of, I hear this a lot. Um, a consumer product company, an entire company that takes a lot of creativity, banana pancakes, a legal memo, choreographer, choreography, Instagram blog, a flower and vegetable garden, wow, exercise studio, sewed clothing, baked bread, cakes, cookies, designed a new office. Ooh. Brandon writes a false narrative about the world around me, trying to explain the crazy, um, painting, oops, it just moved, okay. Um, youth programs in New Haven, Connecticut, a newsletter, sustainable dragon fruit farm. Wow, this is the best list ever. I'm loving this. Thank you so much for sharing all of these great ideas. A hole in my wall is part of a home renovation project. Good, sometimes we need to take things down in order to make something new. Okay, so we've got, I think, a good definition of creativity being anything, making humans, designing a company, creating space in ourselves, um, a photo in India, amazing. Um, so as we're kind of thinking about what it is we've already done in all of the writing classes I'm teaching, my, I'd say kind of um, starting point is saying, what do you already know and how do we build on it? We all know how to communicate and that might be in different ways. My husband does uh, statistics and he communicates in numbers at times, could be numbers, different languages, food, whatever it is, we're trying to communicate something. And through that, we're creating, we're putting new ideas together and making something new. So I would like to share with you, I'm gonna share my screen here, a very short poetry film from Elizabeth Alexander. You might remember her from um, Obama's inauguration. She was the poet. This is from On Being. Her poem is called Ars Poetica. And Ars Poetica is a poem about creating a poem. So it's essentially about creativity. She's titling this Ars Poetica, number 100, I Believe, by Elizabeth Alexander, a poetry film by Jossie Juritz. Make it full screen. Hopefully everyone can see it and we'll be able to hear it. I will play. Poetry, I tell my students, is idiosyncratic. Poetry is where we are ourselves, though Sterling Brown said, every eye is a dramatic eye, digging in the clam flats for the shell that snaps, emptying the proverbial pocketbook. Poetry is what you find in the dirt, in the corner, over here on the bus, God in the details, the only way to get from here to there poetry, and now my voice is rising, is not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died. Poetry, here I hear myself loudest, is the human voice. And are we not of interest to each other? Excellent. Let me... Close this so it's silent. Excellent. All right. So this poem I quite love. The final line, the human voice, are we not of interest to each other? That's what we have. We have each other. We have ourselves. We have all that we know and all that we can create. Now I'm going to ask you if you'd like to use the chat again to share anything you noticed about the presentation of the poem, either from a, pill, uh, a film or design perspective, the word choice, how the poem was created, her voice, Elizabeth Alexander, as she's reading the poem, anything you notice that you might have liked or been interested in or disliked, that's okay too. So you are welcome to put that into the chat. Marie Royce writes, I love the inflection in the words. It really helped me to understand it. Good, descriptive language. Many of us, um, hopefully not anymore, but I think of a certain generation, we learned about poetry in school that it was a really scary thing and no one can understand it and the poet's meant to be obtuse and 
you have to dissect it, but really it's about that voice. It's about communication and trying to reach out to one another. We poets aren't trying to be confusing, <laughs> um, but rather trying to communicate with a wide audience. It brings the concept of poetry to a more approachable level. Nice, thank you, Chuck. Jerry, my favorite line of this poem is poetry is what you find in the dirt in the corner. Good. So in all of kind of thinking specifically about poetry, in all of writing, it's in these specifics, all of these details that you can offer the reader. And it sounds, it sounds wrong that the more specific I am about my life, you, perhaps a stranger to me, can understand me better through those details. But that's what we want. We want you to notice all of those details. Um, let me scroll up. Um, let's see, Rosemary says, I like the literal reference to her voice in the text. Good. Makes me think of connection in so many ways interesting to read it and then watching and listening to it. Good. Hopefully everyone received the handout and you should have received both the, a link to the text so you could read it yourself, see her line breaks, the stanzas, how she crafted it, and also the video. So you can watch it again if you like. I found it inter Okay. Um, excellent. So that's what we have. We have our human voice. We have the dirt, the details. We don't need to be somewhere extraordinary or have the largest experience of our lives in order to create or write something. Um, someone said the captions with words and photographs was helpful and visual. All um, There's so many different ways to access the written word. I think first po lyric poetry is meant to be, um, it comes from the oral tradition, it's meant to be spoken, to be heard. Contemporary poetry we, we've kind of branched off into different directions, but slam poetry, spoken word poetry, poetry on the page. Sometimes it comes to life in videos, broadsides with art behind it. Um, there's so many different ways to read and to understand and then to see it. Your job as you're thinking about a creative practice is to know where you are in this process. What are you good at? What do you like? What do you hate? Tom Lux in Poetry Workshops, he's a poet, um, he's a, he was a poet at Sarah Lawrence would say, you writers are the little God of your work. And I really, really like that phrasing because I keep coming back to it. You are in charge of what you're writing. We all have different aesthetics, different experiences, different joys, different desires, but you're creating something that moves you. And as we kind of move through this session, we'll talk toward the end a little bit about editing and um, revising and what to do with some drafts. But starting at the beginning, your job is to try and blossom in your own voice. You're trying to create your voice. I don't want you to sound like me. If everyone I've ever taught sounds like me, I have completely and utterly <laughs> failed at everything because I want you to emphasize your own voice, to find what it is. It might be different in different pieces and then be in that voice even more. So first, I'm gonna give you lots of exercises and things you can do. We will be doing an in-class writing together. Um, it's not technically a class, but we'll be doing a writing exercise together. One exercise you can do on your own, which we're not doing here, um, is to take some time and write all of the things you do like. So think about all of the moments that have brought you some kind of creative joy. And that can be anything that could be, I usually find that it's helpful before I start making art or writing is to take a walk, to do something physical away from the screen that we're all staring at for eternity these last few years um, and do something physical. Yoga was mentioned. I think if there's some other thing you can do to kind of move your body, sometimes you get a rhythm and you get some kind of sense of yourself, you're present in yourself, and then you're able to think in words. We start with emotions, we start with the body, and then we move into word choice and the specificity of writing. So does anyone have a regular writing practice already? You can put this into a chat if there's something that you regularly already write, aside from spreadsheets and memos and things for work. <laughs> Um, good. Semi-regular morning journaling, a writing group with prompts every two weeks. Excellent. Go ahead. So you read these articles that come out. Oh, gratitude journal. Nice. 
come out all of the time about writing about habits. How do we form a habit? And I read this great piece. I don't think I included it, um, but I could share it. I'm going to make a list about exercise, which is obviously a different topic and not something I know a lot about. But it, the point of the article is essentially in order to create the habit of writing or the habit of exercising, you start very small. You don't say I'm going to train for a marathon and run whatever it is, 26 miles, but rather one minute. I will start with one minute a day, two minutes a day. And it's really hard. Many of us are working full time. Some of us have kids at home. Some of us have kids learning from home because of the pandemic. We have all of these various responsibilities that we're trying to juggle. That is very difficult and frustrating. But no matter what you're doing, you have your mind and you can find a couple of minutes um, to just get into the habit. And if every day, maybe in the morning, maybe in the night, you try and do that writing, you'll get used to it and it'll become easier and a part of your time. Um, Susie Wright writes, I write when I'm angry. And I think we all write from some emotion, as I said in the beginning, that we want to know, we want to untangle, we want to understand. Maybe we've lost someone, we're writing in grief, maybe we're writing in anger, frustration. Many of the books that you might love to read are not joyful. <laughs> there are many books that work with very difficult topics, probably because the author is trying to understand something about the human experience. Even if that piece takes place on another planet, in another world, where we are not, we recognize these human emotions between us. Um, and that's what we want to understand. Long missives to people at home and doing international aid assignments, sporadic work, creating a new writing group, daily thoughts. Um, ooh, Carrie asked, do you recommend writing by computer or writing by hand? Okay, so I gave you the exercise, if you like, to write about where you find the creativity when you find it, um, know your natural rhythm. So I am an early bird. I cannot function late in the evening at all. Very tired. Um, so I try and write in the morning since I became a parent, that's just about impossible to do, but I try and use that energy as much as possible. So I think that comes back to this question about writing by hand or by the computer. Think about what works for you. What is your natural inclination? And you do that whatever it might be, as long as it works. And then when it doesn't work, because sometimes things stop working, um, you try something else. You might try using your, ooh, oops, sorry, using your phone and then doing an audio recording onto it. And then maybe using software that transcribes it. Maybe the act of typing out what you have said as you listen back to yourself will help you in the editing. One danger of writing on the computer is that it looks beautiful. It's perfect. It'll tell you if you've spelled something wrong, if there's maybe a grammar error. So I think it's helpful to do a little bit of everything. Um, maybe start on the computer, maybe start by hand. If you've only written on the computer, I recommend printing it out and then editing it with a pen, looking at it differently, reading it aloud, listening to it. Sometimes reading it aloud into a recording and then listening to it can help as well as an editing process. Um, Let's see, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, Daniela says she has many half-written journals. She stopped writing, it's not a habit. I think it's really helpful the best you can if this is something you would like to do is to do it regularly, even five minutes a day, two minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. A really great new journal with some prompts came out that's on the list that I gave you titled, Write It, 100 Poetry Prompts to Inspire by Jessica Jacobs and Nicole Brown. They wrote it together. Um, it's good for any genre, poetry, prose, often there are, you can't really see, but quotations and then suggestions and prompts. Now, this will lead us into the writing we will be doing here together. So, um, you can't really raise your hand, but I'm curious to know how many of you have done a writing prompt where you've done an in-class writing and you've just written during the time period. If anyone has done it, maybe you can put that into the chat and say yes or no. Yes, Andrea has done it. We have a no, not since high school. Some yeses, some noes. Thank you. Here's your job during a writing prompt. The secret message, 
as my son would say, the life lesson behind this writing prompt is that you can take five minutes at any time and do this. You can take a prompt from a book like this. You can take a prompt. I understand, understand that Carrie's sending out prompts regularly. You can respond to that. You can look up prompts online. You can make your own prompts. They're endless ones everywhere. Um, also writing Natalie Goldberg. I don't know why I have the smallest edition in the world, but Natalie Goldberg has a great book, Writing Down the Bones with some prompts in there and on her website. So your goal is to take a period of time. We are going to do five minutes. I will time you. And you write. You write and you write and you write and you write. And you, write. you don't stop writing. As you're writing, if you think, this is ridiculous, I don't want to do it, instead of giving up and checking your email or walking away, you can write, I shouldn't have done this. Chloe is very annoying. Forget it. I will never do another thing like this. And then you will just keep writing. Um, so you just write. Now the prompt is exactly that. It starts you in a place and you can go anywhere. It doesn't mean that you need to keep coming back and using that part of your brain to say, no, I must answer this question. Instead, it's just a beginning. So the prompt here is beauty. I will write it into the chat. It's a very small prompt. It's a single word. We have all experienced it. Your beginning here is to say, where do you find beauty? What is beauty? How is beauty? Where is it? Is it the energy between two people? Is it the light coming in through your windows in the morning? Is it the street lamp light coming in your windows in the evening? Is it a reflection? Is it the mountains, the sea, the dirt in the corner, as we heard from the Elizabeth Alexander poem? anywhere. You can write this in any way. Some of us are what are called eakers. Um, I don't know about that word, but you start, you just maybe you write three words and it's really hard to keep going and you're mostly thinking, but I'm encouraging you to be what they like to call gushers. Just write and write and write and write and then see what happens. So you might describe yourself, another person, a voice, Maybe beauty exists in a particular moment in time. Maybe it exists in a color, in a museum, in a state of being, anything. So I will set the timer. If you have a question about this, please let me know in the chat. Your goal is to write for five minutes. You can open up a Word document. You can use paper and your hand and just write. And your job is to write for five minutes. Hopefully there are no questions. I don't see any. <laughs> okay, writing for five minutes on the prompt of beauty, go.
one more minute. Ten more seconds. Please finish what you're writing. Okay, time's up. So if you could share in the chat, how did that go? What did it feel like? Was it fun? Did you hate it? <laughs> Someone votes for fun, who went well. Amazing, excellent, good, good. Oh, I'm so happy. Created a sense of gratitude, nice. Interesting what direction it took, your arm hurts. <laughs> you know what, if we're not used to writing by hand, it's hard to get back to it. I watched my child learning how to make his handwriting clear and it hurts his hand and I had forgotten about that. Compared to writing we do for work, it was nice to follow the thoughts without having to make a causal connection. I completely gushed and ended up on a completely different topic. Nice to get started. Once you get with the flow, it's hard to stop, which is a great sign. It was fun. Uh, Susanna said she was surprised that she got a full thought out in such a short time, um, ended up in a place you didn't expect. Nice. It was nice we didn't have to focus on a certain direction. Short memory recall is good. Good. I think it's amazing. And it's a really good way too, if you're stuck on something, um, you could use this as, I don't know if you need an excuse, but to explain why you're doing creative writing in a workplace environment, to say that it helps you to be more creative. It helps you to get going. Just like an athlete needs to stretch and exercise and a musician needs to just keep practicing. We need to kind of keep these muscles going. It's really hard to just jump in without kind of having some warm up and getting used to it and having the habit. Um, Susie said it went all over the place, prompted by the beauty I spoke of was not the beauty she usually thinks of. Nice. The whole goal is to loosen those muscles so you're comfortable if you get into this habit of doing it every day, you never know what will come up. Maybe nothing. You might write something that's awful and useless, or you'll draw a new connection. Something new will be revealed to you. Excuse me. You'll understand something else. You'll be surprised in some way. If you, the creator, are surprised as you're writing something, then we, the reader, in the later draft that you share with us, will have that same feeling. We'll be surprised too, because we're there with you. You're taking us on this journey. Um, so the more that you can, we talked a little bit in the beginning about time, maybe a pre-writing activity. We don't want to make this process too precious. We can't say it must be silent. You need the perfect pen, the perfect idea, the perfect bottled water next to you, but rather it needs to be something you can do almost anywhere at any time because you're in the habit and you're able to do that at any time. So habit is really important. The regularity, it'll become easier as you keep doing it. And then you can use prompts like this for anything. You could even use it for work. You can be like, I don't know how I'm supposed to talk to this client in some fashion. Let me kind of brainstorm different ways that it can go and write it down. It might be something for a larger write, writing project. You might say, I have this character and I don't know what he thinks about his father. And then just do a writing prompt on that particular dilemma. Um, and the more that you keep doing this, it'll be easier to be more creative and to come up with something new. Now, what do you do with this? First, um, I had a student in class the other day say, 
that she never deletes anything because she has a fear of commitment. And I think that's awesome and a great way to phrase it and how we all should think about this. Honestly, this is my new guiding post to say that we can't lose anything. Unlike painting, let's say, where you could do something with oil paints and then really need to work to undo it, um, you can save all of your drafts. You can keep them forever. And then you have all of these great drafts in case you need to go back and you say, oh, I turned everything into the third person instead of the first person. And it was terrible and it made a mistake and I need to go back. And you can go back to these earlier drafts. Um, so on one hand, save everything. On the other hand, you might need some privacy. You might say, I don't want this in the world. No one should ever read it. Someone mentioned earlier about writing when she's angry. There might be some really big emotional private thing that you need to sort out and you don't want anyone to know about. And you deserve as a human that space to have all of your feelings, all of your emotions, name them, put them into words. And that's it. You are allowed to throw them out, burn them in a safe, contained fashion. Don't create a problem. Um, you don't have to save everything. So pretty much all of the writing advice that I can offer you will be as contradictory as this. Save everything, destroy some things. Um, you make the decision. You know what you want to save. You know if you want to put a password on a document on your computer so no one else can see it. If you want to hide your journals, that's fine. And that's up to you. Um, if you are saving them, figure out immediately, if I may be so dramatic, um, a way to save all your files. Hopefully you already have a system either with a cloud somewhere or an external hard drive, or you email them to yourselves, make sure there's a backup copy so you don't lose it, and then organize it in some fashion that makes sense to you. I tend to title my document titles and the file titles in a really direct fashion poem about my spaghetti rather than whatever title I give to the poem, which is inevitably going to change later. So I give really direct explanatory titles to the actual document. Um, you might find that works for you. I heard Rita Dove, the poet, give a talk once about how she organizes her poems by color, which is probably not something we would immediately deduce reading her work, but it works for her. So the job is to you to decide how to organize your work in an electronic or um, paper fashion. Let's see. Sue said, I had an experience where I wrote something, published as a newsletter, and then realized that emotion experience was not processed correctly and it didn't go very well mentally. Yeah, it can be really hard to kind of decide what can be published and what cannot. So let's take some time now to think about now what? Let's imagine that you're writing every day for five minutes really quick before you go to work or maybe any time of day. And now you've got all these things. That might be it. That might be your goal to be present in yourself, experience the moment. Um, or maybe you have a bigger project. Someone wrote about writing family memories and collecting them together. So I think let's take a moment and talk about editing. Does anyone have many things to say? <laughs> if you would like to share in the chat something that does work for you as you're editing or organizing or responding to all of this work that you eventually collect that might be written by hand, might be audio notes to yourself. What do you do with these really, really rough drafts? Because as you're writing them, you don't need to worry about punctuation, spelling, verb tense. You're just trying to generate ideas. But then what? You can't really share these vague um, grammatically incorrect and perhaps incomprehensible <laughs> drafts with someone else, you need to do something. You need to edit and revise them. Um, so in response to what Sue is just writing, I think one really good technique, if you can, and usually creative projects have this flexibility, is to give yourself time. The moment that you write something, you probably have a really big emotion in response to it you might love it dearly and say, this is the best thing I have ever written in my entire life. Or you might have the opposite reaction. This is terrible and awful. And I am sorry that I have done it. Whatever it is though, I think you let it rest. You let it maybe a night, maybe a couple of nights, you let it sit on the side and then you look at it again. And by looking at it again, you can say, 
Oh, here are some really good moments. So I think that's the time when, if you want to, you can print it out or you can use your editing function in the comments or just edit directly onto it. Again, thinking about saving your documents, I think when you make big changes beyond punctuation moment or two, um, you rename the document so you can save it. And then you hand write on there, maybe you circle some key words, some key ideas and see what you wanna explore further. You might take those small moments and then do another writing, um, like generative writing moment in response to that and say, ooh, I mentioned this smell from childhood in the summer. Let me write some more about this and see what other language or feelings I can invoke from that moment. And then you kind of gather that together and then start to make some changes. Let's see, Peter writes, how do you commit to publishing when you're a perpetual editor? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so some people will say, I forgot who originally said this, um, that you don't ever finish a piece. A piece is never perfectly finished, but rather <laughs> abandoned, which is not an optimistic way to look at things. Um, but it is really hard to say, that's it. So I think once you have done all that you can do and you've shared it with other people, it's a weird experience that writing is mostly happening while you are alone in a room, quietly writing, but it's a form of communication. It doesn't come to life until someone else has read it. There were some comments earlier in the chat about forming writing groups. And I think that is the most amazing thing that you can do is to have a group of people and to share your work. It gives you deadlines usually to say, we will be doing this every month or every week. And we will share the work. So you know that you have an audience, you have someone who will read the work and then ask for feedback. When you're doing workshopping, I think the best thing for you to do is to read your work aloud or have someone else read it for you. And then you get the opportunity to hear it. I find that very helpful. I'm in a group, we've been doing that. Um, it's amazing to hear it in someone else's voice. It's a little cringy and hard at times to hear someone else, but that's what happens when you've written something and you've published it. It is out in the world. There's no opportunity for you to go to a bookstore and say, excuse me, you read that wrong. When you flip through that page and you read that and decide you didn't like it, you were wrong because blah, blah, your work has to stand on its own. So if you start with a small, safe audience in this workshop, you've submitted it early, someone reads it aloud, maybe someone other than the author. And then perhaps you, the author, have presented some questions and said, I really need some help on character development. I'm not sure the chronology makes sense. Can you look at my verbs? That will help you to have the insight to start to make those revisions. When you submit something to your group, you probably should have let it rest a little bit and then done a number of drafts yourself. Um, okay, so we talked about some time between drafts. It's helpful to listen to it aloud, even in those early times, you can read it to yourself. And then you can start to look to see what you've done well and what needs some work. One really helpful tip I've heard from um, like undergraduate writing center people is to say, make two lists. What is it you usually do really, really well? Let's say you are great with sensory details. You can imagine the smells and the feelings and the air blowing in the air and you're able to create that environment, put that on the list. Maybe you're really good with punctuation. You can make dialogue, you get people's voices, you know how to use the punctuation to share those voices, put that on the list. And then you make another list of things that don't go quite as well. And maybe that's adjectives. Maybe you use so many adjectives that you can no longer find where the verb is. Maybe you write everything with the same kind of sentence structure, you start all of your sentences with, I did this, I did that, I did something else. And you wanna vary your sentence structure. So now you've got these two really long lists, of hopefully at least three to five things on each list that you usually do well and that are challenging for you. Then you take some time and you read through your work with each item in mind separately. As brilliant as everyone surely is, it's impossible to read through something with everything in mind at once. But if you read through just for dialogue, just for strong verbs, just for chronology, it'll be a lot easier to focus 
what I like to call your editing eye. And then you can catch things that you think you might be able to strengthen. Um, you should read, you should read everything that you want to. <laughs> um, on one hand, you should read things you really love. And you should also be trying to read things in different voices by people who write differently about different subjects and see what you can learn from them. If you read something and you hate it, ask yourself why. What is it that the author did? Do you just not care about the subject? So it's not of interest to you? Or did something happen in the writing? Is it the organization, the presentation, the character, the narrative voice? Was there something, the way the work was built that turned you off and you don't like it? Notice that. And then in your own writing, don't do that. <laughs> Try really hard to avoid these things that don't work for you. And then do the same for work you love. Let's say that you have a favorite book. Outline it. Notice how the writer structured it and built it. Building a book is much like building something out of Lincoln Logs, that you start with the pieces, you have the words, put them into sentences and then paragraphs or stanzas. And then you start into chapters or sections and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And really think of it clinically in that sense that you are building a thing from your words and your emotions. Now that sounds very contradictory to this earlier work that I was saying that you do in order to access your ideas where you start off being present and just drawing connections and kind of following your heart or your feelings in order to uncover something new. And it's true. <laughs> it really, this writing really takes these two sides of yourself. And back to my idea about noticing when and how you write well, it's also noticing how to use that energy. So it's a little woo woo, but I think the more that you can think about now is a generative moment for me. I'm feeling a lot of emotions. I need to sort something through. This is when you sit down and you do lots of writing prompts or you write towards a particular project. When you're not feeling that, that's a really good moment to say, here is my editing time. I'm in the right space to say, no, I'm gonna kill my darlings. I'm gonna cut this down. It's let's say 5,000 words. I'm gonna make it a 500 word flash piece, a really short piece, because there's too much excess here. Um, I think it's helpful to think of all of this as a process. It all builds towards something else. It's impossible in any art form to say, I'm going to sit down and write the great American novel, the great masterpiece. I'm going to write the perfect poem and ode to love and everyone's lives will be changed. It's pretty hard to have that objective. But if you commit the time, you literally just sit down and write and get used to it and build your muscles and stretch them and trust yourself, you'll start to work towards something and you're probably writing the same subject over and over. Laurent Bosselard used to say in grad school that all writers are obsessed with some kind of topic. There's something we want to understand. And if you think of this as a process, you might be writing the same thing in really different ways constantly not quite getting there. Um, I had an experience like this. I wanted to tell this one story and I wrote poems and I tried to write fiction and everything sounded dumb to me, but I kept doing it. And even though I wrote honestly dumb, terrible things, it got me later to a moment where suddenly something clicked and I wrote this lyric essay that told the story I had been meaning to tell. And it came out quickly and it didn't need a lot of editing, which is a hundred percent against everything I always teach or recommend. However, all of those other things were drafts that led to this, even though they weren't exactly the same, it was my mind kind of sorting it out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but we're kind of chasing some obsession that we each have. And oh, now I forgot exactly what she said, but Alexander, um, Elizabeth Alexander was saying, right? It's the human voice and are we not of interest? That's who we are. We have these voices. We have experiences. We try to assign meaning to what's happening around us. And the writing is a process to understand that. And it can really help us to feel settled in ourselves and in our worlds. And another really good exercise that you can do is to say, I'm going to just write me. And many of us don't. With many of my writing students, I will see 
even when they're writing memoir about themselves, these very external pieces about what happened. And it's more of a journalistic account rather than an inhabiting of the space. So one exercise you can try later is to say, I'm going to write me in this moment, which comes back to the title of this workshop. What does it feel like to sit here? What does my chair feel like? Where are my feet? What do my clothes feel like on me? What does the air feel like? How am I interacting with this space? If I'm alone, how do I feel? If someone walks into the room, how does that change the dynamic? And the more that you can find out through the writing, your place, your physical body, your emotional state, your relationship to the space, your relationship to other people, you can apply all of that indirectly to other characters or other experiences if you start to write something larger that's not memoir or poetry with an I, with a first person, with your own experiences. Um, so I gave you many, many resources that are just a start. I mean, there's bookstores and libraries full of more resources and online reading series and many, many classes that you can take. I work as a writing coach. If you're interested in working one-on-one -on -one with someone, um, you have here, I can give you my contact information again in the chat. We have a couple of minutes left. Are there any other questions about writing or creating or the space that we're giving ourselves to try, to try to write something and create something that maybe we wanna share with other people or not. You are welcome to share anything into the chat. Another editing approach that you can do is to underline all of your verbs. The verbs are literally the muscle behind your work. They're pushing everything forward. So you might take your piece and then circle or underline all of the verbs and look at them and notice how much muscle do they truly offer and how do they push your work forward? You might remember that old garbage bag ad that was like, wimpy, 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 hefty, hefty, hefty. I use that <laughs> with a second grade um, writing workshop to think about the verbs. And I always have that silly tune in my head when I think about how can I make my strong, my verbs stronger and give them that heft, help them to push everything forward. You might notice what verb tense are they in? Are they in a simple verb tense? So they need a lot of helping verbs. Is it the conditional tense? Is everything a gerund that kind of softens the edges? How are you using the most, I'm gonna say the most important part of speech in order to move your ideas forward? And that's your verbs. And then you wanna look at your nouns. You wanna make sure that they're really specific. Maybe instead of tree, you say birch. Maybe instead of bird, you say raven. All right, try and name things. It's all these specifics that help to ground us in this world that you're creating. And then that helps you to see and to really know where you are. The more that you can express it too, you're present and you're experiencing this world and you're looking around um, and coming back to the writing prompt, you're finding that beauty, you're finding the light, or you're finding what it is that's around you and you're naming it. And that's what the writing process is. And maybe your creativity ends up in something more visual where you don't need to name it. But I think the writing helps us to see where someone is and where you are. And then you can, you can be there in that moment. If you have studied another language and you've traveled abroad and lived in that country or spent some time with people who speak that other language, you'll notice how they're using words slightly differently. Maybe it's the order, maybe it's who's doing the action, who um, is a subject of a verb or of a sentence. And then that gives you a different sense of understanding as well. And if you can turn that back to your own language and be surprised and notice how the individual words are doing the work. You're able to strengthen your own understanding, your own presence, your own, someone had mentioned gratitude earlier, even gratitude toward this world around you as you name it and experience it and share that with other people as readers, which you might not choose to do, but if you want to, I think the writing can easily move from something for you to a dialogue or a conversation 
with more, more people. So we still have about five minutes if there are any more questions about editing or revising or writing prompts. I am here to help answer. How do you know if what you've written is publishable? Good, that's hard. <laughs> um, so I think you want to read a lot of, let's say in the very beginning, you start to submit to literary magazines. You read them, you look to see what's being published and you notice how your work compares, fits, if you should consider submitting there, maybe submit somewhere else. I'm going to share um, a link with you. Um, new pages. Yes, that's it. Newpages.com is a great place to look for literary magazines. There's so many different kinds that you can be submitting to, reading to them. Creative writing is not an incredibly lucrative <laughs> um, path, which means that many of these literary magazines, if they, especially if they're not funded by universities, are acts of love by the editor. So I really, really recommend that in order to be a good literary citizen, you not only read and submit to them, but you get a subscription, you buy them and you use your dollars to help support, support the literary magazines, the independent bookstores and the writers. Um, do you write with demographics in mind? So I think your job, we talked, I talked a little bit about voice, but also audience. Who are you writing towards? And you can, even give yourself a writing prompt to say, who is my ideal reader? What do they know? What do they need to know? If you're going to use certain, let's say, jargon or words from another language, or you're placing yourself outside of this particular moment in time or another country, what do you need to explain or not explain? And that sense of knowing how much you can say slash assume will help you to know who your ideal audience is. I don't think you should write for everyone. I think you should write for a particular kind of reader so that you can be really focused in what you're trying to produce. Um, any guidance on starting a regular journaling practice is the process different from creative writing? I don't think so. I think the writing regularly either using external prompts or your own prompts or just writing what happened during the day. If you start to simply, um, let's say outline all that I did this, I did that, and then I did this other thing, um, you're gonna get pretty bored and you're gonna want to ask yourself the rude question that I always come back to in anything that I'm editing or reading or helping someone to workshop is, so what? <laughs> what does this mean? What did you learn? What did you gain? Why is this something you're remembering? And that will help you to understand yourself really well, I think, to understand what you're even noticing, right? Anytime you leave a group of friends and then you remember a story from the past, they might be like, I don't remember that. I remember this other thing. And different things are important or of note to different people. So if you come back to that question of, so what, why, why am I remembering this? What does this mean to me? How does it reflect on my current life? I think that will really help you. Um, and it always, I think for journaling or the creative process, I'm gonna try and make this terrible chart here. You might've studied how narrative plot happens in literature when you were in school that like, here's a character, da, 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 you have some kind of problem. Ah! Then you have a climax, something has changed. You've solved the problem in some way, faced it head on. And then whew, there's a new normal. And what's important is this space in between that you are no longer who you were in the beginning. And this is the answer to the question, so what? How are you changed by something that's really important? How are you ending up in a new place? Um, can I answer one last question? Sure. How do you overcome writer's block? I think it's you just keep doing it and you take a new approach if something doesn't work. If you've been trying to respond to prompts and the prompts don't work, try a different approach, take yourself to a museum, really look hard at a painting, write in response to that, try and describe food if you usually write about sports, kind of think of something new to shake it up. Great, take care. Bye. <laughs>
right. Well, thank you, Chloe, so much. Um, this was re really great, Cer certainly out of, um, at least out of my normal every day. So I really enjoyed it and I, I'm sure others did as well. Um, I would encourage all of you to, to look at Chloe's site up here, which she gave you the um, address, chloeelanamiller.com and or her Twitter feed. Um, there's a lot of really, really good stuff on there. Um, as a reminder, this session was recorded and we will send out the recording um, here in a few days and you will also get a an evaluation and we would really appreciate your feedback um, so thank you chloe and thank you mm -hmm. to all of you that have joined us today have a great day